It's my great pleasure to introduce this year's speaker, Brandon Dotson, Associate Professor in the Department of Theology at Georgetown University, where he's been teaching now for two years. Brandon is, without question, I'm a big fan of his, so uh, this may go over the top, but uh, <laughs> he's without question, in my opinion, one of the most intelligent, creative, and productive scholars of Tibet working today. The top student to have studied under Professor Charles Ramble at, Univers at Oxford University, his thesis was a study of law in early Tibet. It is both intensely rigorous and absolutely filled with insights. By undertaking a comprehensive, uh, comprehensive reevaluations of several important and very difficult sources, his results surpassed in countless ways those of some of the field's best known scholars. Upon completing his PhD in 2007, Brandon won a prestigious five year, 1.5 million euro grant from the Alexander von Humboldt F Foundation. He used the grant to assemble and direct a team of scholars at the University of Munich to research kingship and religion in Tibet. The project led to several workshops and conferences and is still producing numerous wonderful publications. Brandon himself used the time not only to extend his knowledge of early Tibetan literature, but to read widely in religious studies, anthropology, literary theory, and manuscriptology. He has four or maybe five, I've lost count, uh, books in preparation. Maybe some of them are already published. Um, <laughs> and several other edited volumes. His two books on the Old Tibetan Annals and the Old Tibetan Chronicles are instant landmarks in the field. I think the latter is still forthcoming, but I'm confident in saying it's already a landmark. <laughs> Both are comprehensive studies of the two most important sources on early Tibetan history. The difficulty of these sources cannot be overestimated. Their archaic language and complex cultural contexts make translating them a huge undertaking, and Brandon has really mastered them both. I could go on about the many other discoveries he's made in the areas of Dunhuang studies and Tibetan manuscripts, but for now I'll, just, I'll focus on just one aspect of his research that I personally find particularly fascinating, and that is his truly creative work on early Tibetan mytho-ritual narratives. These are the Dunhuang manuscripts that I, uh, with Sam von Skyak, would simply uh, pass over during our cataloging project, intimidated by their odd language and unfamiliar imagery. But from his analysis of the tale of the separation of horse and king, to his paper on Semarkar, King Songsengampo's sister and the wife of the 7th century king of Shangsheng, Brandon deploys the theories of other scholars working in Indology, classics, and religious narrative to open up the imaginative worlds of otherwise impenetrable texts. Time and again, he cracks the code of these ancient works by reading them from unexpected perspectives that provide remarkable insights into an early Tibetan culture that is in many ways quite foreign to contemporary Western students of Tibetan Buddhism. So, tonight, we are fortunate to hear about some more of Brandon's recent work, this time in the area of Tibetan divination. And it's with great pleasure that I invite Brandon to come speak on uh, Buddhism and uh, divination in Tibet. Thank you very much uh, for that uh, exceedingly kind introduction. Uh, and also, I want to thank the Kense Foundation for making all of this possible. It's really an honor to be here. It's a privilege and a pleasure to be here back in California on this beautiful evening in such a beautiful venue as this. Now, as, uh, as Jake mentioned, I'll be speaking about divination and Buddhism in Tibet. When he approached me with the offer to deliver this lecture, I didn't realize it was so auspicious as to be the 10th. But I did consider the time. And I thought, well, what should I talk about? I could talk about horses, but I talked about those last time I was in Berkeley. And looking at the calendar, I saw it was only one week away from what is probably the most famous American tradition of auguromancy. I speak, of course, of the uh, phenomenon of Puxitani Phil <laughs> and Groundhog's Day, which was only one week ago. So we'll have a little bit of a look at auguromancy, but for the most part, we'll be looking at divination in the form of cleromancy and the use of dice, manipulating technologies of chance uh, and doing them most often with one's hands. So this is a result of 
12 years or so on and off again working on rituals, cosmologies, and narratives in the context of Tibet's interaction with Buddhism, its assimilation of Buddhism, appropriation of Buddhism, its encounter with Buddhism. There's a few conference papers and articles that have come out of this, but for the most part, uh, what I'm going to show you is works in progress. So, in approaching divination, one of the things that I've been interested in is the kinds of exchanges that are involved between humans and divinities, between humans and divine knowledge, but I've also been at pains to understand how this works. Um, in the past, there have been um, Africanists, for example, who've been accused of not really understanding how Ifa divination works, of writing books about it, but not really knowing how it works. So I'm concerned also to understand how one manipulates these objects, how one gets an omen out of a die. And I'll share some of those techniques with you right off the bat. We're going to begin with uh, a divination. I'm not actually going to roll the dice for you now, but I'll show you a divination that's already been pre-cooked and will reheat it. So what you see first are dice pips. Tibetans didn't use written numbers. Um, actually, I'm not quite sure when they began, maybe 11th, 12th centuries, but they certainly didn't among the Dunhuang manuscripts, so not before the 10th century. There were numerals that they could choose from, Cotonese, Chinese, but for whatever reason, they chose to represent them with pips, circles of the, the same type that are found on the dice themselves. So a roll of 414 would give you the following omen. From the mouth of the road god, you, O oh human, the gods regard you with compassion. If you've cast this divination for a legal case, you will go free. If you go trading, you will win. Without thinking to yourself, I am wise, salute the gods, and whatever you wish shall come to pass. A good divination. All right. So that's given you a chance to reflect on this omen. What's going on here? What can you see? Um, what are the features of this omen? You've seen omens, you've seen divination before. What are the salient features here? You can shout them out. Yeah. It's sort of predicting different ways that you might want to do whether you're involved in business or in something Yeah, so business and, and, and legal situation, if you go for trade, you will win. If you've got a legal case, you'll go free. These are situations of agon, situations of conflict, where there's a winner and there's a loser. Also from the start we see from the mouth of the road god. This is an omen issuing from the mouth of a god. Right? So that's another thing. You have direct speech and then you have interpretation. So it comes from the mouth of a god. Um, the result is telling somebody about their situation and fortune and how this can affect them in these different situations, as you were saying. What else? Any other observations? You might come up with some that I've not thought of. Yeah, there's a summation at the end, right? So it ends with a summation, and we'll get into the structure of these too. Also, there's the gods. There is this emphasis on the correct relationship with the gods, namely one of humility and sincerity. You must salute the gods, you must worship the gods, but do so in a particular way not in a kind of self-absorbed, self-aggrandizing way. Right? So it's imagining this uh, relationship with the gods as being central to what's going on. I like the way it shows where you stand with the gods. Right? That's, that's kind of yeah, yeah, it is. And, and we'll, we'll consider whether that's a matter of revealing what's already there or creating this situation. So what is it the divination's doing here? I mean, some of the, the answers we've, we've teased out. Is it making the gods speak? This is something that um, Sarah Eels Johnston, in the context of Greek divination, said makes divination a unique and contested technology because you're making the gods speak in a way that sacrifice cannot do, in a way that petitioning the gods with prayer cannot do. To make the gods speak, to call them down in such a way, is also, you might say, coercive. And many people had different theories for how this could and could not be the case, what intermediaries like daimones in the Greek context might have been there between humanity and divinity. 
And then, as I was just mentioning, is it revealing one's situation? Is this revealing, in the Buddhist context, one's karmic situation? Is it a diagnosis of one's karma? Is it revealing one's fate, as has already been set by the gods or whatever other um, features might be involved? And how is this fitting within one's own moral and ritual economy? Is it kosher to have this knowledge? Should you, as a mere mortal, have access to this knowledge? Is it not the province of the gods? Is it not the province of enlightened beings with the divine eye? Why should we mortals have access to this just by virtue of rolling the dice or letting them fall? So this question too that I just alluded to, is it bringing about one situation? Is it revealing on the one hand or is it bringing it about on the other? And if it is bringing it about, then we go back to that issue of contest. You go trading, you'll win a profit. You go in a legal case, you'll prevail. Might this issue of contest have something to do with the exchanges envisioned by divination? Now, big picture, I just wanted to set the stage in terms of the larger questions of Buddhism and divination, mostly drawing on a couple of quotations. And these are themes that we'll get back to in, uh, in looking at different uh, Buddhist forms of dice divination. So this is from Gananath Obiasekare in his book Imagining Karma. He writes that karma produces a psychological indeterminacy regarding the life contours of one's present existence that adds to the instability regarding one's moral and spiritual condition. The only way to meet this situation is to know what the past was, but only the Buddha or the Jina or the Arahants have the power to retrocognize the past. Now in Obiasekare's case, the solution for the Buddhists that he's engaged with is astrology. Astrology is also deterministic in the way that Obiasekare imagines karma to be deterministic, but it is psychologically determinate. It gives one an answer. What's the situation? Who were you in a past life? What are the implications for one's future? Now moving from South Asia to China and moving from astrology to divination, we have uh, Michel Strickman's work and this uh, wonderful quotation. For how could Buddhism possibly bar its Chinese votaries from a fuller knowledge of destiny, Buddhism especially, which had after all taught them that there was so much more to know than they had ever dreamt? Not only did the future stretch before them a sequence of new lives, in an infinity of forms and in realms of kaleidoscopic variety. There was also the past, the nightmare past, in which all present and future lets and hindrances would find their ultimate explanation. It was scarcely sporting to open these dizzying vistas and then deny the means of access, replacing the urgent need for knowledge with the passive anodyne of faith. So divination uh, and Buddhism are Kind of, it's a well-hewn topic in Chinese Buddhism. And of course, if you go to a temple in East Asia, if you go to a temple in Taiwan or in Japan or in China, very often you'll uh, practice uh, a form of divination of shaking the sticks loose, and you'll get an omen as a result of that. But divination, in contrast to what Obiasekere was saying about astrology, is not always in the business of giving you psychological determinacy in the form of a clear yes or no answer. Sometimes it does, but more often than not, divination obscures as much as it reveals, or it gives the answer in an oblique or obscure way, requiring interpretation, requiring the client or the querent or the divinatory congregation to make meaning together through the act of interpretation. So coming back to Tibet and to our omen, uh, there's this question of winning and losing. There's this question of the material means of divination being dice. Dice which are imbued with play, which are the technology of games, the technology of chance. Do you win or lose? What is it that you win or lose? If you're winning and losing something, are you winning it from someone? Who are you competing with or who is your partner? Um, so these are the questions that we're going to uh, offer some preliminary answers to in the course of, uh, of this lecture. Now, 
just to, uh, to map out where we're going, I'm going to introduce divination with Pashika dice in early Tibet, by which I mean the 8th to the 10th centuries. And we'll very soon see what a Pashika is. It's a four-sided long die, uh, sometimes referred to as a stick die, um, coming from India. We'll look at the Buddhist transformations of dice divination, and then marshal these uh, examples in order to discuss issues of fortune, issues of karma, and the place of volition, the volition of the diviner, of the querent, the volition or non-volition of the dice and the gods. So in broad brushstrokes, I suppose uh, many of you are very familiar with oracles and divination in Tibet and the topic of oracles and divination um, with your exposure to Tibetan culture, Tibetan religion. Uh, no doubt you've heard of the Nechung oracle. We can divide these, generally speaking, into oracles and divination, though there are other ways to slice the pie. Uh, oracles often called Tlapa or Tlakama or Pawo, uh, Kuten, generally reserved for state oracles and higher oracles, central oracles who are, um, have the imprimatur of uh, the high oracles, offer advice to the government, for example. So you have uh, deity possession, spirit possession, on elite levels and on popular levels. So at the elite level, you would have, say, the four main state oracles of the Ganden Pochang and the Dalai Lamas. On the popular level, you have uh, Lapa, Lakama, Pawo, uh, Nyenjomo, all over the Tibetan cultural area, where in almost every valley, almost every village, you have a man or a woman, often a woman, who, uh, through whom various gods speak. We're not talking about that today. We can talk about it in Q&A if you like. Uh, the, the relationship between oracular-inspired divination and more mechanical, claromantic divination uh, is, is an interesting one. But getting to the latter, you have what many of you know as mo. Uh, you also have the term cha, which applies to Tibetan divination. And here you can include claromancy, that is to say divination with dice, with pebbles, drum divination, where grains are placed on a drum and how they move can indicate a situation. Mala divination, where one counts the beads off the mala. Uh, divination with coins, divination with the scapulas of sheep, uh, jutik divination, thread divination with knots. I've skipped a few. Anybody want to yell out some more divinations that you know of? Doe ball. Doe ball divination. There you go. Mirror. Mirror divination. Yeah, pra. Tortoiseshell. Tortoiseshell divination. Yeah, plastromancy. Yeah, the golden urn hated divination. Um, and then strological, I think I meant astrological, uh, divination. Um, also dream divination. Auguromancy, that's what you do with Paxitani Phil, but Tibetans uh, very early on inherited a tradition from India of raven divination. Uh, looking at the augurs of ravens, where they were in terms of directions, where they were in terms of time, uh, plotting them in time and space, it's one of the earliest Tibetan manuscripts in which you find a grid, a grid of time and space, in order to make meaning of the augurs of ravens. So to move to our sources, in early Tibet um, and our manuscript sources there, we have manuscripts from uh, Dunhuang, from Turfan. It's Dunhuang up here, Turfan. Uh, from Miran, and also from Mazartag. There are 23 identified uh, Pashika dice divination manuscripts among these excavated manuscripts. Now, besides that, you find coin divination texts. These come from Chinese traditions. You find raven divination, as I mentioned, uh, scapulomancy, hemorology, that is to say, a tradition where you're looking at um, the date of somebody's birth, and working out then the years of their life, uh, their prospects in various years, or using the day of the month as a way to decide, should I go north, should I go south, should I go east, should I go west? That's called elections uh, and other techniques involved with hemorology, calendrical divination, you might call it. Dream divination also is present in these old Tibetan manuscripts, as is bibliomancy, where the interaction of person and page is what gives you uh, an omen and meaning. So, many of you are familiar with the Tibetan Empire, but 
Uh, the point that I'd like to make here in showing this map is that the period that we're talking about prior to the ninth century, you know, it's really in the ninth century uh, when you have Indic preeminence coming in, where the translation project becomes so strong, where Tibet is turning its attention to India as the font of culture and religion. Prior to this, in the vast, in the earlier part of the empire, prior to this Indic preeminence, you have all of these different vectors of traditions coming into Tibet. So from China, you have bureaucracy, you have forms of historiography, you have forms of astrology, um, different legal techniques also coming from China. We mentioned coin divination, there's also stock divination of the type used in the I Ching. From Khotan, you have the narrative technology of using prophecy as a form of historiography. It becomes the blueprint for how Tibetans would go on to remember and tell their history in Chujung genres. From India, of course, I've mentioned raven divination, dice divination, we'll get onto that, a whole host of other things uh, from India, of course. Now, so we're not just going straight down into the deep end of early Tibet. I wanted to show you some things that you're a bit more familiar with first and talk about dice divination in particular, since we'll be focusing on dice divination rather than raven divination or coin divination this evening. So the predominant form of dice divination, which you would encounter if you took a trip all across the Himalayas, uh, is involving Maksar Gyemo, form of Penden Lamo. This is also more or less the same tradition that takes um, Achi Chuki Duma, uh, Drikun Kagyu Protectress, as its central figure. More or less the same divinations, but in different skins, so to speak. In the Bun tradition, it's uh, Sipe Gyemo, who is the central figure. But again, these are largely the same omens. This tradition, in terms of the Maksor Gyemo, surely it's older than this, but the manuscripts uh, that I've been looking at in any case, our 18th century to the present. They really do pop up, a lot of them, in the 18th century. Um, the method there is to cast three common six-sided dice of the type that you see there, and to add up their pips. So if you add them up, the smallest number you can get is three, if you get three ones. Largest number is 18, three sixes. So that means you've got 16 possible outcomes. Uh, for those of you who are mathematically inclined and want to do a calculation of probability, you'll see that probability is not equally distributed here. You're much more likely to get a 9, 10, or an 11 than you are to get a 3 or an 18. Another tradition with which you may be familiar is associated with Manjushri. Uh, Mipam included it in his encyclopedic works. Uh, and here the method is also to use cubic six-sided dice but they aren't marked with pips in the usual way that your six-sided dice are marked if you're playing craps or what have you. It's marked with the mantra of Manjushri. Uh, leaving off the om, it's Arapatsanadi. And the method is to cast just two of these, and you don't add them, you combine them. So if you get a tsa and a ra, uh, it depends on which one you threw first. If you threw the tsa first, that's tsa ra. If you threw the ra first, that's ra tsa. Those index different omens. As a re result, there are 36 possible combinations, indexing 36 omens, all with equal probability. How many of you know these traditions? All right, good. A few. Okay, so going back to early Tibet. So here we have uh, another map of the Tibetan Empire, and we have the material culture of dice divination. You have dice and you have books. You don't need to have books, you don't need to have dice. There are other ways that you can make these combinations. You could, for example, uh, have pieces of paper that have a one, a two, a three, and a four, and just pull them out like lots and then put them back so you get different combinations. You could memorize all of these omens. You don't need a book. But the material culture of dice divination, nonetheless, is that of the book and that of the die. So you have books in Dunhuang, many of them. Uh, here is a codex. There's 
The Tibetan manuscripts, the 23 Tibetan manuscripts, are 9th century, generally speaking. There's one that is 10th century, and it happens to be a codex. This is also a codex, 9th or 10th century. That's the Turkic Irkbitik, runic Turkish Irkbitik. Uh, here we have the Bauer manuscript in Kucha. And we have dice found in Khotan, uh, dice found in Kairabad Tepe, dice found in Mohenjo-Daro. And as we'll see, we have dice found as far west as Egypt. So looking first at the bookish side of material culture. If one were to encounter a manuscript like this, even without the benefit of reading this, even if you've just been reading block prints and you're used to Uchan and you don't like manuscripts, there are shapes that you can see. For example, those are pips. Those are the dice pips. There's the omen. There's more dice pips. There's another omen. More dice pips. It gives it this kind of paragraph page setting, which is not found in very many genres of Tibetan writing. You have it in letters, you have it in legal texts, and you have it in divination. But immediately you can see by the page setting what sort of uh, a manuscript you're dealing with. There'd be 64 of these paragraphs, each of them representing an omen. Um, this omen can be elusive, it can be archaic, it can be spoken by a god, uh, and it ends with a summation, as was pointed out. Good, bad, or ding. Ding meaning middle, but generally meaning mixed. Good for some things, bad for others. So these omens are full of gods, they're full of goddesses of the type that we saw to, to begin with. There's not much in the way of Buddhism, not much explicitly Buddhist about these. Hunting, legal cases, those abound, but not too much in the way of meditation, karma, and what have you. To the material culture, so here we have dice from Khotan. This was, uh, oh sorry, that's from Tashila. So this is a die from Tashila. You can see one side with two, oh sorry, one side with one pip, one with two, one with three, and one with four. So that's the same object, and they've turned it and photographed it and laid the photographs side by side in order to lay bare what is on each side. Were you to look at one object, it would look like that. This is from Khotan. This other die with the um, more elaborate pips in the middle, also from Tashila. This, probably from Fustat in Egypt. This also from the Near East. Uh, this is dated 7th to 9th centuries. These 9th to 11th centuries. Near East find spot is actually not clear. It's in the Kalili collection in London. Uh, this I saw in the British Museum last summer. It is uh, from Khyber, and this is from the Punjab. And then this one also from Stein in Khotan. So you can see two different types of dice, generally speaking, two different types of pashikas. You have these more elegant, elongated, generally seven centimeters long by 1.5 centimeters. Um, and then you have these stubbier ones that are about four to four and a half centimeters long, as you see here. And the fine spots are all over Central Asia, down into the Indus Valley, and then further into the Near East. Anybody interested in games, and the study of games? Do you know what Chaupur or Pachisi is? Yeah, so these are the dice that are used for Pachisi or for Chaupur, or in the Islamic context, the game of Nard. Notice that they're not the same. In terms of form, they are long dice. Their proportions are similar to what we just saw, but their pips are different. You can see here uh, six. There's three there and three there, making six. And then on top, there's five, one in the middle, two on each end. So there's the six and there's the five. Same thing for this that's showing. The sides of two and one pips are not visible, but those oppose. So you have two opposite five and one opposite six. This is a principle of dice. Uh, this is a principle of a lot of different objects. It's articulated uh, by Neoplatonists. It's articulated also by Islamic theorists generally having to do with the seven heavenly bodies, right? So there's a cosmological reason for balancing the dice with opposing sides adding up to seven. 
this gives us a little bit of a mystery. Why are our dice unbalanced? Because as we saw from the other image, and as you can see here from this die, it wends around 4, 3, 2, 1. 1 doesn't oppose 4, and 2 doesn't oppose 3. If it did, the opposing sides would add up to 5, and you'd probably have to cook up some nice reason for why that should be the case. 5's a fairly nice number. I don't have anything against 5, but people generally haven't made that argument. And in fact, because these wend around the dice the way that they do, the die is unbalanced. 4 and 2 oppose, and 3 and 1 oppose. It goes 4, 3, 2, 1. Why might it do that? I think I've given away the answer. You can see it there already. It has to do with the Vedic world ages, the yugas, uh, going from Krita to Treta to Dvapara to Kali, uh, 4, 3, 2, 1. It's from the names of the dice rolls that the names of the world ages uh, take their, their names. So this gives you a kind of cosmological significance for why these divination dice should be unbalanced from the perspective of the study of dice as objects. A six-sided die, for example, will also have opposing sides adding up to seven. So why is it an outlier? It's an outlier because of the yugas and because of its Indic origin. So, to pursue its Indic origin, I want to go on a brief excursus from Tibet into India uh, to look at the Bauer manuscript and to look briefly at the transmission of this tradition of divination outside of India. So you have this 6th century birch bark manuscript from Kucha, it's in Brahmi scripts, and it is made up of several parts, some of them are medical, some of them are divinatory, and parts four and five are actually separate texts within this, this uh, manuscript. They're both divination texts, similar in a way to the Pashaka Kevali, uh, a better known uh, Indic divination text. So when one looks at these texts, and they begin with introductions very helpfully, they're not fragmentary like most of our Dunhuang manuscripts. One finds invocations to Shiva, to Narayana, to the Maruts, to the Rishis, to the Matanga woman, and so on. So you have a lot of these different um, characters who are invoked, a lot of different gods and people invoked in, in these divinations. So I opened with uh, a divination that had four pips, one pip, and four. So let's see what 414 is here. They used numbers. 414, four, one in the middle, four at the end. The object which thou art thinking of, that indeed is auspicious for the promotion of thy advancement. But thou dost not respect thy father and mother, nor thy friends and relatives. Nor dost thou worship the elders, nor Maheshvara, thy family Devata. Hence, none of the goods which thou thinkest of will come to thee. But, if he is propitiated, he will give thee peace and the desire of thy heart. So that's uh, Hornless translation from the early 20th century. So we've seen here there's numbers. Uh, there's a concern also with worshipping the gods, worshipping the gods that one already has a connection with, your family devata. In uh, the second of these two texts, there's also confirmatory augurs. So you have your omen, something like this, and then at the end it says, the reason this is true is because there's a mark. That mark is a mole. You have a mole on your thigh, right? So that's confirming it. Um, so you would presumably look and you'd say, oh, right, I do. This must be true. Um, so that's a kind of funny particular feature of this text. And it pops up again in one Tibetan Dunhuang manuscript. So there is, um, there are other markers that, that suggest transmission and that is one of them that doesn't quite approach a smoking gun, but is uh, still fairly compelling. So, coming out of India, and as I said, having this little excursus on this tradition and how it got to Tibet and where else it went, 
this is a shared technique. It's a shared technology. I mentioned already that we find these dice, um, such as the one kept in, in the Louvre, all the way into the Near East, as far west as um, Egypt. So you have the Bauer manuscript from Kutcher, the Pasha Kekevali, in terms of the Indic world. You have the runic Turkish Irkbitik from Dunhuang. In Chinese, there's the Moshi Sholwo. Um, in Arabic, there's many texts that are called Kitab al-Fal. Some of these include dice divination. These are often attributed to Jafar al-Sadiq, uh, famous 8th century vizier of Harun al-Rashid. And then in Persian and in Turkish, you have essentially the equivalent of the Kitab al-Fal, but it's the Falnama. Not all Falnama deal with dice, but some do. And in terms of the pips, we've seen pips in Turkish, runic Turkish, we've seen pips in Tibetan, we've seen numbers in uh, the Bauer manuscript. We also have numbers in Chinese. And in the Islamic tradition, there's letters. So letters are used in lieu of numbers, but they're used as what we'd call Roman numerals. You use the first four letters of the Arabic alphabet. Or the Greek alphabet, as we see here, and we'll get to that. So to give you a flavor of some of these and what they look like when they cross these linguistic and cultural borders, uh, here is an 1855 Ottoman Falnama. The image is something different. Um, it was translated from the Arabic, uh, and then from there it was translated into French, and now you've got my translation of the French here. So it's a little bit of um, uh, telephones. But there you have the equivalent of 414. Uh, fourth letter, first letter, and fourth letter of the Arabic alphabet. And it says, be content, you for whom everything succeeds. You can expect many good things. You will be delivered from sorrow because you will obtain goods and fortune. You won't need to submit to any challenge, and you will receive a large profit from trade. All your desires will be satisfied if it pleases God. One assumes that's inshallah at the end. Uh, so, 414 turns out to have been a fairly nice choice. It seems to be auspicious in these traditions that we're looking at. Um, happy so far with what we have. Notice there's also trade. So, presumably, the clientele would be merchants, or among the clientele would be merchants, similar to what we found in the Tibetan. Um, and this emphasis also on, on the will of God. Now, this image is from an Arabic manuscript, not from, not from a Turkish manuscript. Uh, it's from a Bodleian manuscript, 14th century. Uh, it includes the Book of Wonders, a fairly famous illustrated manuscript. And within this text, it's not illustrated here, but there is uh, a Kitab al-Fal that concerns dice divination. So I haven't got my hands on it yet, and actually I just need to convince somebody working in um, Islamic esotericism that these are worthwhile, and that they need to have a look at them. The Irkbitik, we mentioned already, and here you can see an image of the text, Runic Turkic from Dunhuang. A woman went away, leaving behind her dishes. Then she stopped and thought thoroughly, where am I going apart from my dishes, she says. She again came back and found her dishes safe and sound. She rejoices and becomes delighted. It says, know this, it is good, this is good. Right, so you have that clear summation in the same way that you have that clear summation in the Tibetan texts. This is very impressionistic, it's very poetic. Um, it's not very strong in the way of pre-interpreting it for you, saying this is good for trade, this is good for health, or this is good for any of the other common categories of divination. It stays there with the impressionistic omen and then goes right to the summation. Moving into Chinese, um, I should mention here that this is part of a collaboration uh, with Connie Cook, Berkeley alum, and with Zhao Lu. Um, they're colleagues of mine at the IKGF, uh, Fate, Freedom, and Prognostication, Concepts for Coping with the Future in East Asia and Europe, a research group that I was a part of a few years back. And I kept bending their ear about this text to the point where I think to get me to shut up, they decided that we'd all translate it and work on it together. So here's 414, and you can see the numbers at the top of each omen. Uh, this is named the uh, De Shen Set. It's heaven will protect you. This is a rough translation. It's in the process of being smoothed over. Many of the things you seek will go back and forth, and perhaps they will not be accomplished. 
So just seek the three jewels and you will shed difficulty. After reciting sutras about goodness, you will get advancement. So here this text is pretty thoroughly Buddhicized. It follows a common Chinese Buddhist divinatory technique of attributing it to an Indian non-Buddhist god like Brahma or Maheshvara. Um, he's also associated Maheshvara with mantic practices like Aveshu uh, from the Avesha in Sanskrit. And this, um, this text also mixes a lot of local divinities with well-known Buddhist figures like Dizang, Chitigarbha Bodhisattva. Uh, and other sort of um, usual suspects for divination in China. All right, so excursus done. Let's go back to Tibet. Now, I mentioned of those 23 manuscripts, 22 of them are most likely 9th century. One is 10th century. That's the codex. That codex happens to be the only one that has an introduction. The introduction has an invocation. It talks about the ritual setting. Um, and it includes the following information. One, that there's a modak. That's the term for the diviner. One has to pay a fee, a ye and a yun, to the diviner. That's a gift and a fee, a ritual fee. Invocations are made to the sun, the moon, the four directions, to the seasons, or at least summer and winter. And crucially, to groups of goddesses known as men, samatamana men in a descending vertical axis from sky to mountain to plain. So there's a group of men that you invoke in the sky, those that you invoke on the mountain, those that you invoke on the slate, those that you invoke in the meadow, coming down to the river. So it's an image of descent and invocation. This includes um, Nam Karmo. In some uh, tellings of the Gesar epic, she is his uh, sort of fairy godmother, so to speak. You also have jewels, fragrance, and food and drink offered to the men. Uh, open question as to whether this would also be an offering to the modak. Also from this, and from the other divination texts, we know that the verb that's used for casting the dice is not to cure. It's not to throw them or to roll them. They fall. It's bup. Not even pup, to cause to fall down, but bup. What else bups in Tibetan? Rain. Rain falls. Snow falls. Gods fall, too, when they fall into you and you're a medium. So does the doom if you're a Gesar bard. So there's three falls of one die, or there's one fall of three dice to produce an omen. You need a four, a one, and a four, right, to get the omen that we saw. Order matters. So a three, a three, and a four is not the same as a three, a four, and a three. As a result of that, you have 64 possible outcomes, uh, each equally probable, and those 64 outcomes index 64 omens that are kept in a dice divination book. So you repeat that process of letting the dice fall three times. As a result, you get three outcomes and three omens. And here it's interesting too because there's a dynamic between the oral and the written, where in this opening to the codex, it says that the diviner reads aloud or recites the omens. So um, here it's assuming that she is using a book or that he is using a book. Now in, in taking apart the components of a divination omen, we can construct an ideal type. The ideal type has four components. First is the pips that you see at the top of each paragraph. Then there's the omen, the omen proper, uh, either in verse or from the mouth of a god, or sometimes both. Then you have the interpretation, or the pre-interpretation, sometimes called the oracle, if you want to use the omen oracle pair. This says what the omen is good for, good for health, good for trade, good for travel. And then finally, you have that summation as the fourth element of a divination omen. So I should say that this is an ideal type, and some texts lack pips. Some texts have pips but lack an omen. Some texts have pips but lack an oracle or interpretation. Um, they, they all have summations, though. All right, so with that, let's get on to a kind of meta-divination, where we'll have three 
different omens in the way that you would do if you were going to let the dice fall. Here you have a 3-3-1. Oh, up on the northern plains over there, they seek seven gazelles. The thieves shall never get them. They are the property of the Mumen goddesses. This has fallen on the divination of the men goddess, Gupang Shele. If you've cast it for household fortune and life force fortune, then the fortune of humans will be undiminished and the fortune of livestock will be undiminished. The gods protect your happiness and long life. If you undertake some matter, it will be accomplished. If you've cast this for a sick person, he or she will recover. If you've requested an official post, it will be given. If you've cast it for subsistence fortune, for Sicha, you will have C. If you've cast it for companionship or marriage, you will meet it. If you go for trade, you will make a profit. If you've cast it for a visitor, he or she comes near. For so whatsoever you've cast it, this divination is extremely good. Right? So it's covering all bases, almost all concerns that you might have as somebody who's gone to a diviner, as a client. Uh, and this is a very um, auspicious one. Notice the difference. I've underlined it by giving you the wily there. Fortune of humans, mi cha, and fortune of livestock, chuki yang. These categories of cha and yang are important. Very often cha tends to be associated with humans, yang with animals, with domestic livestock, but they are overlapping categories in the same way that one's fortune as a human with livestock has a lot to do with how one's livestock is doing. All right, so before we get these other two divinations in our meta divination, let's just unpack the four elements as I introduce them in this particular divination. Essentially, you have protesis apodosis, if this, then that, as a fundamental principle of divination. And you have two here. You have nested protesis apodosis pairs. You get a 331? Three, three, well, 331, three, that's good. And if you get this omen, well, then you get this interpretation. So you can see how if this, then that sort of follows in these nested protesis apodosis pairs. Also, looking to that long list, if you've cast it for such and such, then this is the case. You can see a lot of divination's concerns. From that, you might make the leap to say these were the concerns of the people who were using this divination as well. These most often have to do with types of cha, cha being fortune or propensity for good fortune, this kind of um, quasi-substantial thing that is called in from wild spaces into domestic spaces and which brings people good fortune. So you have Sicha, you have Sokcha, you have Dacha in terms of your situation with respect to your enemies. There's also Duncha for achieving some specific purpose, Kimcha for your household. Besides that, you, these are concerned with sickness, with visitors, uh, with missing things and persons, also with legal cases and with hunting. Those are the main concerns that come up again and again in divination. All right, so let's get on to our second omen in our meta divination. This is from the same uh, Dunhuang manuscript, IOL Tibj 738. We roll, or the dice fall rather, into a two, a four, and a two. Oh, the sky men says, Above the soft meadows, to draw down the deer and female yak, they chase deer thither and stalk seven gazelles hither. I appoint them as my livestock. I gather them and put them in a paddock. The paddock walls are encircled by snow mountains. The snow mountain walls are encircled by cliffs. You, human, who are beset by accusations, now you shall be free of them. A good divination. So here we can start to get um, a better feeling for these these omens and how these divinations are working. Second person hortative, you human, marks the speaker off as non-human, as other, as God. This is the men who is speaking, uh, the men goddess. Also, there's a parallel. You have livestock and you keep them in a paddock. She has wild animals, not, um, uh, not chensen, not carnivorous animals, but ridak, the animals of the hunt, game animals. Um, gazelles, uh, sheep, um, or blue sheep, um, D, and so forth. Um, and these are the possessions of the Mumen, just as your livestock are possessions in the domestic realm. 
All right. Final uh, divination in our meta divination. This is also included in the same uh, text. 133. Oh, since you made a good offering to the site, you killed your hated enemy without even worshipping the Kula. You killed a deer on the wastes without even exchanging with the men goddesses. This is good. Offer to the gods of the land and hunt the deer of the north. Gather your beloved relatives and strike your enemy's heart with a dagger. This divination is excellent for whatsoever you've cast it. Right, so this is fantastic. It's, it's an unwanted boon, an unearned boon. You're getting something that you didn't deserve. You got this without even worshipping the god. You were able to have this kill without even propitiating the men goddesses who are the owners of the animals that you as a hunter kill. Right, so this is excellent for whatsoever you've cast it. Here too you can see the concern with enemies. Uh, and this image of plunging the dagger into your enemy's heart. So what lessons do we take away from our meta-divination and these three omens? One might be random narrative generation. You let the dice fall, they index an omen, you read that omen, it's elusive, it's poetic, then you read another, and then another. You have three chances to find a way in. Three chances to identify with it in some way or to find something to latch onto. It's going to give you insight into your situation. Also, that's objectivizing. It's following the rule of three in the sense that you don't just want one omen, you want three to make sure it's right. And if they all three agree, then that's going to be more persuasive than if you just did it one time. We can see also from these that they are future-oriented. Divination is not always future-oriented. It can deal with hiding or with revealing what is hidden in the present. It can deal with figuring out what happened in the past. These tend to be future-oriented. Um, we've seen this second-person hortative voice. The god is exhorting you as a client or a querent to do something. We see persistent images of contest and hunting. There are hunters who are trying to get the, uh, the wild animals, but they can't. Or you, as a, as a client, have killed the wild animals. Um, and what's at stake here is cha, this substance, this fortune. The men, goddesses, are the owners of the wild animals, and there's a dynamic of worship and exchange between humans and men. Humans and men, goddesses, that is. So, in outlining this economy of fortune, and this economy of cha, Cha fortune is typically for humans, and this has been written about by uh, John Vincent Beleza, by Daniel Barunsky, and by Charles Ramble recently. It's an essence of fortune, and in terms of cha and yang, it's been said that cha is what makes humans human instead of wild men, in the same way that yang is what makes livestock livestock instead of wild animals. It, what, what makes a horse a horse instead of a kyang, for example. So it's this paradoxical thing in, in the sense that it's a wild essence from up there and out there that's called into domestic space, domestic animals, into human beings to make them tame and not wild. So fortune, generally speaking, yang is called in, yang gu, yang bu, through rituals where you know, one will um, wave a sheep's leg or a deer's leg, it's supposed to be a deer's leg, but sometimes a sheep's leg is substituted, and often shout ku or kuye, to call this in, to call the yang into the community, into one's household. Um, it can be for a household, it can be for a larger community. And this is constructed in, uh, in this dynamic of up and down. You have uh, up and wild, ya, ri, ri being wild but also being hill, as um, any student of first year Tibetan knows, down and domestic, the ma, the yu, the lung. Calling in the yang, that's echoing what we already saw. The hunters shout ku in some of the omens. It's a hunting shout. So, in contrasting these two ways of getting fortune, vaguely speaking, you can talk about work and play. Calling in yang in this ritual, you don't have too much risk. The ritual might not work but that's not so risky. It, if it doesn't work, you don't get any of this fortune. You don't get the yang brought in. The target of yang is this primordial deer, and it's from the body of this primordial deer that the yang is supposed to come into existence, and now you can call it into domestic space. 
you find that in the, the chants that are, um, that are used uh, in young calling rituals. They're called into a village or to a household, and it's benefiting livestock and it's benefiting humans. Looking at ritual play and dicing for cha, on the other hand, you can win or you can lose. If you get a bad omen, and we haven't seen any yet, I've spared you the bad omens, um, if you get a bad omen, it can say you'll die within the year. You know, it's, it's very serious. So you're staking something when you allow those dice to fall. The target is wild spaces. It's from those wild spaces where those animals are protected by the, um, the men goddesses. It's from there that you're calling in this cha or you're winning this cha. And you're winning it as an individual or as a household and also for humans and for livestock. All right, so the implications of this is that this is not just a diagnostic technique for revealing what's hidden, but rather this form of old Tibetan dice divination with pachakas is a technique for changing one's situation, for winning or losing fortune. We go back to dice and dice and the ludic. Um, the question of how much play is there already there in the object itself? And what are the men goddesses doing? Are they your opponents? Are they your partners? Are they both? It seems to be from these wild spaces that they oversee that one is winning cha. So is one taking it from them? Are they losing the cha when you win it? Here we see very often the idiom of ritual deception, so common in Tibetan ritual. You think of deceiving as trying to win this from the goddess. Sometimes one takes her perspective and seems to be on her side. But other times, as we've seen, when you get the kill without even placating her, it's very clear who you are. You're the hunter. Now, in terms of the men goddesses, they are female, uh, and you have a legacy of um, female associations with divination coming from, from India in the Pashakakevali, also in the Bauer manuscripts that we've looked at, uh, Apsaras being associated with dicing and with games, virgins also. Uh, we saw the Matanga woman as, as being um, somehow affiliated with dice divination. And then going up to contemporary Lhasa, there's a, there's a really interesting situation. It was described by Daisuke Murakami. And it's the case that women in Lhasa aren't allowed to play sho. And you can see a sho set here. They're not allowed to play sho because Pendent Lamo is the tutelary goddess of the Lhasa area. And she's affiliated with divination and with dice. And if women play sho in Lhasa, they always win. So the men won't let them play. So back to Buddhism. Does this have anything to do with Buddhism? We've seen exchanges with gods who are showing their favor. There's hunting, there's trading, there's contesting legal cases, there's killing enemies. Um, the gods who speak the omens are local gods, mountain gods. They're not bodhisattvas. They're not Buddhist figures. So I don't think any of that rules out it being Buddhist or on the face of it, or at least being practiced by people who identify as Buddhist. But let's look more explicitly at Buddhist dice divination, at Buddhist inroads into the technology of divination. So here we have two different Dunhuang manuscripts, two modes of Buddhicizing dice divination. In this first one, you can see the pips, you have dice, and there's a Buddhist kind of window dressing or facelift involved. And then here you have another text where a stronger Buddhist foundation is laid. It's not just cosmetic. There's really a concern with, uh, with Buddhicizing this. So here in, in the, uh, the manuscript on the left, IL Tibje 743, you have a similar technique, but now the omens come from the mouths of Buddhist figures instead of coming from the mouths of uh, other non-Buddhist gods. Um, on the other hand, you have the transformation of omens, dispensing with these usual categories of sicha, sokcha, and so forth, and building into it a moralizing worldview with karma uh, and so forth. So in the first example, this kind of window dressing, you can say it's a technique of find and replace. Find any place the text says God and put in a bodhisattva. Um, not quite as simple as that, but anyway. Here's a 443. This has fallen on the divination of the bodhisattva who has gained mastery. For whatever this has fallen, it will return and be delivered to you. The gods show favor to you and grant that you enjoy good fortune. 
such that it will be as you wish. If there is something lost or missing, it will return and be delivered to you, without your having to pursue it. If you've cast this divination for a sick person, he or she will recover without having to be nursed. If one were to investigate this divination, it provides excellent power. Whatever you undertake will come to completion. It is an excellent divination. So here we see the elements one, three, and four. There's no omen. There's no elusive omen spoken from the mouth of this bodhisattva who has gained mastery. There are similar concerns, health, lost persons, lost things, similar semantics, bup, falling, um, similar relationship with the gods in, in a lot of these, uh, these omens in this text. But there's no cha. You have kewa instead of cha for fortune, for good luck. Now also, these texts are not overtly moralizing. You have one omen further on where it says, if you've exercised this for malice or for killing, then it is a bad divination. Now, that's not the same as saying it is bad to use divination for malice or for killing. In fact, it's almost confirming that you can use this Buddhist divination for malice or for killing. Now, the other technique, install the Buddhist foundation and moralize. In Paleo Tibetan 351, very fascinating manuscript, you find an introduction. The bodhisattvas and the emanations spoke it from their mouths and taught it as a divination text. It was set down as something to be faithfully held and as a powerful omen. When casting a divination, one should bathe and make a great purification. Being without doubts, if one should offer incense, flowers, scented water, it should indicate clearly and reliably show what is to come. Right, so this is future-oriented. You're dealing with purity. One has to have sincerity and purification in order to, um, to perform this divination. So there's preliminaries required. So you don't have dice pips in this text, but the omens are something like this. Um, for whatsoever you cast this divination, previously what had been greatly delayed will be immediately accomplished according to your wishes, and you will come to possess it. Not being lazy, take it into your hands, and with wrathful methods do not be afraid of and do not avoid whatever laxity there is and whatever anxiety there is. It is an excellent divination. If you've cast it for yes or no, it is yes. If you've cast it for happening or not happening, it will happen. If you've cast it for going or not going, it will not go. So that really simplifies it at the end. Yes or no, happen or not happen, come or not come. Uh, the evaluation is very clear and it's very simplified. It's future-oriented in principle. The text goes on to mention enemies as an important category of divination, but it deconstructs enemies in a typically Buddhist way. It doesn't say, you will defeat your enemies. It says, with regard to those who you conceive of as your enemies, X will happen. Right? So it's a meaningful uh, turn in deconstructing identities. But wait. We have this omen too. Human, your friend is called Ishimishiha and acts as Vajrapani Sri Shakyamuni. Opening the door to the seventh level of the heavens, you will perform the yoga that you receive from the judge on the right hand side of God. So do not worry, do not be afraid, and do not be scared, but do whatever you wish. You will be victorious, and there won't be any obstacles or hindrances or dunergeic demons. For whatsoever you cast it, this divination is excellent. So. Is this Buddhist or is this Christian? Is this uh, Catholic inclusivism avant la lettre, uh, saying that um, Ishimishiha is acting as Vajrapani Sri Shakyamuni, whoever that is? Right, so we have a kind of eerie silence. The, the legacy of this is that it drops off the map for about three centuries. You don't have any texts. I mean, this is a problematic period in Tibetan history anyway, but in the Near East, the archaeological record for these dice also dries up. Generally, 7th to 10th, 7th to 11th centuries is when you find them, but no finds from this period. The record is partial, but the books remain. Um, so the question is, are these dice just going to be phased out and replaced by this four-sided die and this familiar six-sided die? Luckily, it pops back up again uh, in the 13th to the 14th century in the Tendra. So here you have the Mozi Jampe Yang. It's attributed to Shanti Deva. And it's translated by Gotam Sri and Tarpalotsawa Nimagensen. He was a teacher of Butun, 
based at Sangpu Neotok. So this text has 64 omens, like a good divination text should. Um, it's also found in Bodong Panchen Chokle Namgyal Sungbum. But it uses a slightly different pachaka. Same form, same dai, but it has the syllables a, wa, ya, and da inscribed on its four sides rather than the pips four, three, two, and one. Now the opening instructs you how to make this die. Uh, you need to take it from the root of a north and east facing uh, wood apple tree, cut it during the second watch of the night on the 14th day of the month of sp first month of spring while reciting a particular mantra. Now you carve its sides with a, wa, ya, and da. These happen to be the first four letters of the Greek alphabet. Now, this is a puzzle that Michelle Strickman solved years ago, um, essentially saying that, well, this transmission into Tibet came via Hellenistic um, traditions, initially with Islamic intermediaries, most likely. Now, he thought it might have gone as far back as Alexander, but looking at the archaeological record in these dice found in the Near East in the Kitab al-Fal and the Fal Nama, I think it's more likely that this is a recent transmission. It came out of India to the Near East, it was in Tibet also. Tibet dropped the ball, lost the tradition, and it was retransmitted later on from the Islamic world. And this is why it has Greek uh, letters. So there's some differences in how this divination is practiced. You have to concentrate on your Yidam deity, develop one-pointed concentration in the matter at hand, invest the dice with the question that you have for it, and you do this by consecrating or empowering the dice 100 times with a mantra. There's another mantra that you recite when you're casting the die, and the verb here is cure. You're actually casting the dice. You're not letting them fall. So this puts the emphasis, or it shifts the emphasis, to the diviner or the client. There's a real need to have sincerity and to transfer the intention from the person to the die through the technology of wankur, of empowerment, consecration, and through mantra, sometimes also blowing on the dice. To get a feel for this, let's have a look at this divination text equivalent of a 414. Listen, Quirant, this undertaking you propose is like seeking a jewel in an ocean. Now you are entertaining doubts about it. Examine the matter well, but don't exert yourself. Whatever you're intending, none of it is good. There is a risk that your person, body, or life will be afflicted. If you exert yourself greatly, then even though you'll accomplish a little bit, it won't be all accomplished, and you won't see any benefit at all. Therefore, completely give up hope. It's bad. <laughs> right, so here, there's danger involved. It's still second-person hortative. You, human, do this. Um, or you, querent, jipapo, do this. And you have a summation. That's not the case in every one of these omens. They don't all have summations. They make use of analogy. They say, if you ask what this omen is like, it is like this. It brings up karma. <coughs> you have a phrase such as, due to the power of karma, there will be a short delay, but eventually you will complete your task. Jinlab recurs. You have blessings given by the gods, the blessing of the Dharma. Also the Yidam. The Yidam recur very often here. Uh, you're enjoined to worship your Yidam deity or recall your Yidam deity. No cha. Cha, fortune, is absent in this text. Okay, so to conclude with this, let's just take a glance back at those more well-known Buddhist traditions that you know, that use six-sided dice. So you have Maksorgyamo, Achichukidoma, and this Arapatsana uh, divination. They all require preliminaries. So if you're doing the Achitlamo divination, you need to practice an achihlamo sadhana repeatedly until you manifest certain signs. Until then, you're not supposed to practice this divination. So, again, this, um, this issue of sincerity and, and ritual concern is at the forefront. The dice are consecrated, one blows on the dice, one recites mantras, and also within the omens, there's many correcting rituals. You get a bad omen, well, there's a ritual for that. Go perform a du, or go do this particular ritual. Um, also, in these texts, you have a lot of cha. You have si cha, you have sok cha, uh, you still have that category, and you have 
gods, the Gowehla, uh, the Gowehlanga, the five gods who are born with the individual. Those make an appearance. Interestingly, you have a new form of cha, not just sicha, sokcha, but also chicha, your dharma fortune. So what I think we see here is a kind of push and a pull. Pushing divination towards Buddhist morality and karma. Correcting rituals you can also think of as a sort of foot in the door. Um, in the same way that maybe you don't want to go to the dentist because you're just going there for a cleanup, but then they tell you you need a root canal. Um, here you're going there for divination, but suddenly you need to perform a dur ritual. You need to go and perform another ritual. So you can think of it as a, a foot in the door in that respect. So you have it pushed towards Buddhist morality and karma, but you have it pulled. Also, you have Buddhism being pulled towards economies of fortune, sokcha, sicha, the persistence of these categories, and also pulling it to the extent that this new category of dharma fortune, chucha, uh, makes an appearance. Most of all, you have the semantics of volition and the semantics of non-volition. One casts the dice, shokyur, versus non-volitional semantics, uh, where the dice fall. So the dharma is being accommodated. Monks and medita meditators are now clients, and divination is reflecting their concerns, just like it reflected the concerns of hunters and merchants prior. So, to conclude, the Buddhist adaptation of divination is not just this issue of window dressing, of reframing or reskinning, um, taking out Max um, or Gyamo and putting in Achichuk Yudoma. Uh, rather, it goes into more detail in, in installing a morality of karma, in installing um, and taking apart issues like enemies, saying those who you think of as enemies, rather than just enemies full stop. But at the same time, it's not a full transition away from these earlier economies of fortune. It's not what you find in China, where it's a simple karmic diagnostic. The ludic element of competing with the divine to win or lose fortune is minimized, and it's replaced by an exercise of ritual control by the Buddhist practitioner. But this is done in a backhanded way. The dice are consecrated and empowered, but this is actually to take possession of them, such that they can be cast or thrown, and they're no longer permitted to fall, to fall on their own, or to fall at the pleasure of the gods. All right, I'll stop there. Thank you.